And thank you, Dr. Dillon and Wireless at BT for providing me an opportunity to come here and present. So as he introduced, I'm Sudeep Pai. I work with Dr. Park uh, here at Wireless at BT. And today I'll be talking about how we can uh, define the exclusion zones for the primary users so that we can protect them on the one hand and in the other hand we can how we can also provide uh, improved spectrum utilization efficiency for the secondary users of course without uh, causing interference to the primary users and the title of my talk is defining incumbent protection zones on the fly a dynamic boundaries for spectrum sharing So let me start with this slide. I know this is very common slide in our area, but this is what motivates us to do the research. So we all know wireless spectrum, the radio spectrum is the lifeblood of information technology. And, but unfortunately, the radio spectrum is limited. We cannot create it, even if you want it. But what we have been doing is we have been creating a lot of wireless devices and smartphones and hence increasing the spectrum demand. So the uh, spectrum demand is already higher than what we have available. So this, this spectrum scarcity is as impactful to a nation's economy as any other scarce resource. And this, this can be supported by the fact that in the recently held uh, auction for AWS 3 band, I think that was a few months ago, uh, that the band was, I think, auctioned out for several billion dollars. So we can see how valuable wireless spectrum is. And unfortunately, the spectrum allocations that are based on exclusive licensing to the primary users, they are already proven to be highly inefficient. So there is a need of there is a need for a spectrum sharing, as Dr. Martin Cooper says in his words, the only way to solve people's needs, people's need to communicate wirelessly is by new technology. We cannot create new spectrum. Basically what he's saying is you need to share the spectrum. So now it's time to share the spectrum. So several uh, advancement has been you know, put forward by the regulatory bodies such as FCC and the NTIA. So opening up more spectrum, they have realized, the regulators have realized that opening up more spectrum for commercial users has tremendous potential to spur both technological as well as economic uh, growth. And realizing this, FCC has plan to, in fact, it has decided recently to open up 150 megahertz uh, spectrum in the 3.5 gigahertz band. And the, the 3.5 gigahertz band, in the 3.5 gigahertz band, the primary users are basically the federal, mostly federal and some non-federal users. And if, if the spectrum sharing in 3.5 gigahertz band becomes, you know, comes into practice, then it will be the first practical application of federal commercial spectrum sharing in the United States. So yes, now, now we all agree that we need to share the spectrum. There is no any other way. So how do we do that? We, we can share the spectrum with, you know, among multiple users only if we can ensure that they do not cause interference to each other. And more importantly, if that the interference to the primary users who have actually exclusive license to that band is of critical concern. So the traditional way of protecting the primary users from interference caused by the secondary users is by defining the exclusion zones. So an exclusion zone is a spatial separation reason where secondary users are not allowed to operate. Only primary users who have uh, the license to that band, they are only allowed to operate inside that region. And it is the primary, you know, preventive enforcement scheme that the FCC and NTIA, they employ to protect the incumbent users from secondary user-induced interference. 
And the problem of defining the exclusion zone boundary is not as simple as it sounds. So it is challenging because of the two conflicting requirements. First, it should be significantly large so that the primary users can be always guaranteed interference protection caused by the secondary users. So that is the first requirement. On the other hand, the another requirement is that it shouldn't be overly large, you know, it shouldn't be overly large so that the secondary users are not able to use the spectrum. So for example, we, we can just define an exclusion zone to be arbitrarily very large, you know, uh, to, to have a very large radius boundary, but doing that will not allow secondary users to operate inside that region. So it means it will uh, decrease, it will decrease the spectrum utilization efficiency, and we don't want to do that. So let's see some practical examples of exclusion zones here in the US. So first of all, in the TV band, which is somewhere around 700 megahertz. So the protected contour, service contour of a TV station is computed using F curves. So an F curve denoted by FXY, it guarantees that inside the TV coverage region, the received TV signal is at least, you know, gig. The received TV signal is above a threshold, which is predetermined. In at least X percent of, in at least Y percent of the locations, at least X percent of the time. So this is kind of the definition of an F curve. And furthermore, you know, even after employing the F curves, the regulatory specifications require that the detector should have uh, you know, significantly high sensitivity so that even in the case of deep fading that, you know, might sometimes occur in the propagation environment, even in such scenarios, uh, the primary user does not get interference from the secondary user operating outside the exclusion zone. So basically they just add a safety margin of around 20 dB, which translates to a significant increase in the size of an exclusion zone to, to basically protect the TV system incumbents. And of course, this is uh, not a very optimal uh, strategy to uh, define an exclusion zone because it results in an overly large exclusion zone. Let us see what is happening in the 3.5 gigahertz band. Similar to the TV bands, the exclusion zones in the 3.5 gigahertz band are overly large. And here in the 3.5 gigahertz band, the primary users of the spectrum are uh, satellite earth stations and shipborne radar stations among you know, many other federal and non-federal users as well. And studies has, you know, have estimated that approximately 60% of the United States population, they fall within the exclusion zones defined for the shipborne radars in the 3.5 gigahertz band. So in the figure, you can see uh, the exclusion zone, they cover most of the coastal areas where spectrum has the highest dollar per megahertz per population value. And this really results in, uh, you know, scarcity in, in the already scarce spectrum. So from these examples, uh, we realize that there is a need for a new framework for defining the exclusion zones because existing definitions of exclusion zones are overly conservative and they are rigid, like they are not flexible. Once they have been defined, it stays the same, you know, until a uh, like significantly long period of time until the regulators realize that it is too large and we need to revise it, something like that. So they are defined by considering the worst case interference scenario. Just because they are rigid, they are not flexi flexible, they, are, they have to be defined in the conservative manner. And another, another reason for uh, the conservative definition of an exclusion zone is because the aggregate interference that is caused by multiple secondary users operating you know, around the primary users, it is very difficult to predict in advance. And in the absence, when there is no any real-time uh, real-time system to monitor the aggregate interference 
received at the primary user, it makes sense to just define the exclusion zone boundary in a conservative manner. Because we, we in no any case, can risk the um, primary users from getting interfered. And the legacy definitions of exclusion zones, they use, they use a fixed geographic contour around the primary user, and it considers the union of likely interference scenarios from you know, several primary users and a conservative propagation model to define the exclusion zone bound. And this leads to a very conservative estimate of how much protection should be provided to the primary users, because it can be as large as hundreds of kilometers. I'm talking about the exclusion zone radius. And another flaw in the legacy definitions of exclusion zone is that, as I mentioned before, they cannot adapt to changing conditions. Let's say, you know, our, our wireless spectrum has been shown to be occupied differently at different times. So for example, in the busy period of the day, um, there, there might be a very high demand of spectrum while in the night times and the maintenance hours, we might not need there, there might not be a lot of secondary users requesting the spectrum ban. But the current definition of exclusion zones, they cannot adapt to these kind of changing conditions. So I gave an example of uh, the spectrum demand, but the other conditions that might be you know, changing once in a while, they are uh, primary user protection requirements, secondary user network conditions, uh, spectrum demand, and et cetera, and, and other, other variables as well. So we need more flexible and dyna dynamic definitions of exclusion zones that can adapt to various changing conditions, as I mentioned before. And we, we also need analytical models and frameworks, and also simulation tools to actually validate the effectiveness of the new definitions. Because we, we, we do not want the primary users uh, to suffer from interference uh, while, while we are in the pursuit of actually improving the spectrum utilization efficiency of secondary users. And in this research, we focus on devising a new analytical model and a framework for defining and analyzing the primary user protection zones. So this is our proposed framework. We call it multi-tiered incumbent protection zones. So our framework has been designed in such a way that it can be applied to any spectrum sharing scenario, which is governed by a central entity. So by a central entity, I mean uh, database. So for example, database-driven spectrum sharing is, a, is an example of a control, con, controlled spectrum sharing, where there, there is a central entity, the database, which uh, controls access to the spectrum you know, that, that is being used by the second user. So in database-driven spectrum sharing, all the secondary users which want to uh, operate in a particular band, they will query the database. They will provide their location and all other operating parameters to the database. And the database will uh, reply to those queries with spectrum access grants, if available, or, or, it, or it will deny the request, saying that there is no uh, no spectrum available at your location if you want to use those parameters for transmission, something like that. So MIPS framework, it, it provides an analytical model, and it is for determining the boundary of the exclusion zones used for protecting the primary users. And another advantage of our scheme, our framework, is that it provides valuable insights on the interplay and trade-off between the primary user interference protection requirement and the other requirement of spectrum sharing, which is increasing the spectrum utilization efficiency. And as I, as I mentioned before, but let me emphasize it once more. So this framework is fundamentally different from legacy definitions of exclusion zones because it has been designed to be dynamically adjustable based on the changes in inter interference environment, network conditions, and uh, interference protection requirements of the primary user. So 
some characteristics of our framework. Is, let, let me describe some of those characteristics. So one of them is we provide probabilistic guarantees of interference protection to a primary user instead of a deterministic guarantee. So for example, you know, the notion of interference is itself a stochastic process because the wireless channel is, it behaves as a stochastic process. So if we really want to provide deterministic guarantee to the primary user, we have to be very, very conservative and then make the exclusion zone very large. So it is the probabilistic guarantee that allows us to actually uh, reduce the size of the exclusion zone without <coughs> significantly interfering with the primary users. And another advantage of this framework is that it can be used to integrate the benefits of two different approaches that are very popular in spectrum sharing. The first, database-driven spectrum sharing, in which this framework is based upon. And another approach is spectrum-sensing-driven spectrum sharing, which has, again, several advantages, several benefits that database-driven spectrum sharing cannot provide. So our framework actually uh, has the potential to seamlessly integrate uh, those benefits together. And another uh, feature of the MIPS framework is that it supports tiered access for secondary users. So this is important because uh, for the 3.5 gigahertz band in the NPRM, FCC has clearly mentioned that spectrum sharing in 3.5 gigahertz band will be based on tiered access. So there will be multiple tiers of secondary users that will be operating, and our framework is also in line with that uh, proposed scheme. So I'll describe that in their slides. So let us get into the actual architecture of the MIPS framework. So MIPS basically consists of three zones. They are no access zone, limited access zone, and unlimited access zone. So if you see the figure on the left, uh, there is a primary user at the center of the circle. And right next to the primary user, we have defined a no access zone, which has a radius of R1. And outside the no access zone, the annular, annular region in gray color is the limited access zone. So, and outside the limited access zone is the unlimited access zone. So what, what does what do all of these zones mean? Like what are the features? So in the no access zone, as the name implies, we do not allow any secondary user to operate in that region. So that is like a hard exclusion zone boundary. No secondary users are allowed. And in the annular region, the gray annular region uh, named limited access zone, we allow a controlled number of secondary users to operate in that region. So how do we find the uh, number of secondary users that can operate in that region without causing interference to the primary user? So we, we, we set up a problem formulation to find the solution to that problem. So for now, uh, let's just understand that the limited access zone, it allows only a limited number of secondary users to operate in that region. On the other hand, in the unlimited access zone, again, as the name implies, any number of secondary users can operate in that region. So now, now how do we define the boundaries? That, that is the main challenge of, of this framework. So let us start with the outer boundary. So we define the outer boundary to be static, you know, just to get a starting point for our, for our problem <coughs> uh, formulation. So let us, let us define the outer boundary to be static and let us define it conservatively, you know, just as the regulators have been doing for the for, for, for the several years. So the outer boundary is defined conservatively such that any transmissions occurring outside the the outer boundary will not you know contribute to the interference caused at the primary user. So it is it lies very far away from the primary user basically. And the inner boundary so the inner boundary is dynamic in nature, and it depends on uh, several you know, factors such as uh, the network conditions, the, secondary, the number of secondary user requests coming from the region, uh, and the primary user uh, requirement, the protection requirement, et cetera. And, and also the secondary user, secondary to secondary coexistence factor, and et cetera. We'll come into all those details later. <coughs> 
or when we actually formulate the problem. For now, uh, what we need to uh, take away from this slide is that the outer boundary is static and it is conservatively defined, and the boundary is same as the exclusion zone boundary that the FCC and NTIA have been defining for protecting several primary users. And we define the inner boundary uh, dynamically based on the network conditions. So, and in the right, in the, in the figure to the right, you can see an irregular shaped, uh, non, uh, no access zone, limited access zone, and unlimited access zone. So it accounts for the fact that the propagation characteristics might be different in uh, different directions of the primary users. So here we consider, consider a sectorized model where in each sector the propagation characteristics uh, can be different or be same, you know, based on the actual terrain and the actual uh, wireless propagation environment around the primary user. So now, so how, how do we uh, ensure probabilistic guarantee of interference protection to the primary users? So as I mentioned before, the notion of interference is an inherently stochastic process because the channel behaves like that. And therefore, providing probabilistic guarantee to the primary users is a practical approach. And we can model the probabilistic interference protection as follows, as shown in the uh, first equation. So here, P denotes the probability, and I ag denotes the aggregate interference, which is the summation of interference caused by uh, individual secondary users operating uh, around the primary user. And ITH denotes the interference threshold that the primary user can tolerate. And epsilon denotes the probability, probability threshold. So the aggregate interference can exceed the interference threshold only epsilon fraction of the time. It is a very small number, generally 1% or 0.5%, something like that. So now, another thing to note, let me get back to previous slide to explain this. So the aggregate interference. So now the main challenge is to model the aggregate interference. So here, as I described, when I described this framework, there, there are no any secondary users operating in the no access zone. And the secondary users that are operating in the unlimited access zone, they do not contribute to the aggregate interference because they lie significantly far away from the primary user. So the only interference that the primary user suffers is because of the interference caused by the secondary users operating in the limited, limited access zone. And to model the aggregate interference, we, we sum up the uh, interference distribution we sum up the interference caused by each and every secondary user, uh, which is transmitting from the limited access zone. And we have uh, two summations there. The first, the inside, the inner summation represents the fact that uh, it it sums up all the it sums up the interference caused by all the secondary user operating in a particular LAZ sector, and the outer summation sums up all of the interference caused from each of those sectors. So first we, we find the interference caused from each sector originating from each uh, LAZ sector from the right figure. And the second summation, the outer summation is adding interference from all of those sectors. So now, uh, so before, before I start this slide, so from the previous slide, we we saw that you know, modeling the aggregate interference is a challenge because first of all, you know, we, first of all, because of the uh, uncertainty in propagation, wireless propagation environment, it is very difficult to actually you know, know the exact instantaneous aggregate interference that the primary user is suffering at any given uh, instant of time. So what we need to do is, so what, what we can do is we can uh, borrow some, you know, probabilistic, or we, we can borrow some stochastic theory and then apply it here to model the distribution of interference, aggregate interference, instead of actually characterizing the instantaneous 
aggregate interference at the primary user. So proceeding towards that, let's make the following <coughs> assumption. Let's suppose uh, the following propagation model is valid for, for the radio signal. So this is basically a simplified propagation uh, model with uh, shadowing. And here A is the path loss <coughs> at a reference distance from the secondary user. And B is 10 times gamma, where gamma is the propagation, sorry, path loss exponent. And D represents the uh, distance of the radio path with respect to a reference distance, which we consider to compute A. And uh, this psi represents the log normal shadowing coefficient. And also, let us also assume that secondary users are uniformly distributed in each of those uh, limited access zone sectors. So in each of those sectors, we assume that secondary users are uniformly distributed. So at first, this might look like a very stringent assumption because we all know that secondary users, they tend to be clustered around you know, some particular areas. So to, to account for that, our, our you know, multi-sectored LAZ framework, it, it actually accounts for that fact as well. So we, what we can do is we can consider different density of secondary users in each of those sectors, and then it represents the clustered model for the secondary user. <clears throat> and starting with the above propagation model and the secondary user distribution, we can approximate a secondary user's interference power that is received, that is experienced by the primary user to have a log normal distribution. <coughs> so there is one caveat which I will talk in the next slide. <coughs> so the figure on the left represents the PDF and complementary CDF of the interference caused by each secondary user at the primary user. So it is a distribution of secondary individual secondary uh, users interference at the primary user. And we can see there is a close, uh, close match between the actual interference that, that is caused at the primary user and the approximation that we made. So we, we approximate that the, that particular interference has a log normal distribution. So we can see that the, our approximation is quite valid. And in, in a significant, for a significant range of omega where omega is uh, defined at, as the ratio of R2 over R1 where R2. Is it conditioned on the location of the secondary transmitter? Or do you randomize that location as well? Oh, it is ran randomized, uniformly distributed in that sector. Because if you didn't consider that, then our propagation model itself is log normal, so we, we don't need to. So you're saying that uh, even after randomizing, it behaves like log normal? Yes, yes. So there, there is one caveat, as I mentioned in the previous slide, and I will explain here. So the caveat is the ratio omega, which is R2 over R1, where R2 is the outer radius, the radius of the outer boundary, and R1 is the radius of the inner boundary. So if that ratio is very large, then our approximation kind of deviates away from the uh, actual uh, interference distribution. So in, put in simple words, what we can say is we cannot have you know, too small R1 and too large R2. We cannot have that. Otherwise, our modeling, you know, our model fails, basically. Our approximation doesn't apply. So then R is small, basically makes a constant. That's why we keep this approximation. <coughs> If that randomization region is large, which is what R2 by R1 <coughs> bigger means, mm -hmm. then this approximation doesn't really Yes, yes. So, but, but that, that is quite understandable. I mean, that is quite valid in the situation that we cannot, in any case, allow a secondary user to operate too close to the primary user. So R1 has to be, you know, large enough in itself as well. And we'll show that in, in the, you know, upcoming slides. And even here, we, we can see that the approximation error, which we define uh, as the Euclidean norm of the actual distribution and the approximated distribution, that is what we, uh, how we define the approximation error. It is not, you know, increasing uh, like very significantly with, with that ratio. And even for that 
uh, the value of omega like zero five point zero four, we 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 do not see a very large approximation error, and it has it do not have any it does not have any consequences on the primary user protection, which we will discuss, which we will also demonstrate in our uh, simulation results section. Should it also not depend on the primary user signal power? Say that again. Should it also not depend on the primary user signal power? Like, not depend. You can actually have smaller exclusion zones uh, if he's using higher power. So yes, we, we can have that. But here we are not talking about exclusion zones. Here we are talking about uh, how. R, it's not just R2 over R1. No. So I mean, R1 itself depends on the signal power. Yes. So yeah, here you know our focus is not to like argue how we should dis define R1, but rather see you know what is the consequence of having a small or a large R1 on our approximation of uh, interference distribution of the secondary user. So and yeah, I have shown in this slide that it depends on the ratio of R2 over R1 rather than the actual values of R2 and R1 and uh, another another factor in which this approximation, uh, and another factor that uh, you know might change uh, that might invalidate our assumption is approximation is the ratio of sigma, uh, sorry, the ratio of gamma over sigma, which is the ratio of path loss exponent to the uh, standard deviation of the log normal shadowing that we consider. So if that a factor is very large, then we see a deviation uh, of our approximation from the actual distribution. And in practical scenarios, usually sigma is a large quantity, while path loss exponent is generally 2 to 3, maybe 3.5. So this, uh, th this factor also doesn't you know, make our approximations like too impractical. So we will, of course, demonstrate the results in the uh, results section when we come to that. So now, now we have the distribution of individual secondary users' interference power received by the <coughs> primary user. Now we, we can uh, model the aggregate interference power as the summation of log normal random variables, where the random variables are the uh, interference distribution interference caused by an individual secondary user. And from the literature, we know that summation of log normal random variables can be approximated by another log normal random variable. And there are several approximations uh, that have been proposed. And we chose to use a Fenton Wilkinson approximation in our uh, problem formulation because first of all, it is very simple to implement and it provides a closed form expression for the uh, mean and the variance of the resulting log normal distribution, which is the distribution of aggregate interference in our case. And another uh, reason for choosing this is because it is mostly accurate in the tail region of the complementary CDF cur curve of the resulting log normal distribution. And that is the reason where we'll be most interested in for protecting the primary users because uh, as we can see in this slide, you know, this expression basically, you know, basically holds on the fact that it is related to the tail portion of this complementary CDF curve of the uh, aggregate interference distribution. So, and then Fenton, Fenton Wilkinson approximation provides us that advantage. It is most accurate in that particular reason and we want that to happen. That's why we chose this uh, particular approximation. And these are the uh, expressions for mean and variance of the resulting log normal distribution. So now determining the boundaries of our framework. As I discussed before uh, briefly, that the outer boundary of our framework, we choose it to be uh, static boundary. And we choose it to be static because of the following reasons. Because the spectrum sharing scenario in the unlimited access zone is exactly the same as 
you know, the reason outside the legacy exclusion zones. So there is an unencumbered access to the spectrum outside the, uh, in the UAZ region, just like the, uh, just like the reason outside the legacy exclusion zone. So there is no way, I mean, no reason to define the outer exclusion zone like larger than that, because it is already been defined considering that the secondary users operating outside that boundary will not cause interference to the primary user. So it is already conservative, so we don't need to define it more, we don't need to be more conservative on that. But, and, and, and to define the outer boundary, uh, there, there are several factors you know, that needs to be taken into consideration. So for example, what propagation model do we use to uh, define the outer boundary? And what is the terrain details, ter terrain characteristics surrounding the primary user? And what is the primary user's um, sensitivity to, you know, receiver sensi sensitivity to interference and so many other factors as well. So we consider all of those factors to define the outer boundary, which is static. And again, it's the same principle in which the uh, FCC and NTIA have defined the exclusion zone boundaries for protecting the primary users. And defining R2 in this way allows us to directly compare the performance of our framework uh, with the conventional exclusion zone. So that is another reason why we choose to define how to boundary based on FCC or NTIA's principles. Now the inner boundary, more interesting thing. So the inner boundary, as I mentioned before, is a dynamic boundary. It adapts to the changing network conditions, the secondary, uh, the number of secondary user requests coming uh, from from around the primary user, and it, it also considers the coexistence between the secondary users and and other factors as well. So we formulate the inner boundary definition problem as an as a stochastic optimization problem. So the goal is to find the optimal value of R1 inner boundary radius that maximizes n, where n is the total number of secondary users that operate in the uh, limited access zone. So we want to find the optimal value of R1 inner boundary so that the total number of secondary users that can be served by the limited access zone is maximized. But on the other hand, we also want to minimize the factor omega because it has consequences on our approximations. If, we, if that is too large, then our approximation doesn't hold and it might lead to interference to the primary user. So we want to minimize that as well. And subject to there, there are other constraints as well. So the first and the very important constraint in any spectrum sharing scenario is, the prim is protecting the primary user. And in our case, it is uh, the we provide the probabilistic guarantees of interference protection. So that is one of our inter one of the constraints of this optimization problem. Another constraint is the bounds on the inner uh, boundary radius. So the the maximum value the inner boundary can have is equal to the outer boundary. Of course, where the LAZ region does not exist anymore if R1 equals R2. And the minimum value that R1 can take can also, uh, okay, the, the minimum, the lower bound on R1 can be, has to be defined because we need to consider several factors. So for example, if R1 is too small, first of all, I already discussed that, omega will be too large and our approximation will not be valid. So we set a maximum tolerance for our approximation error and based on that we find the minimum R1 that we can have in our system. Another lower bound on R1 is the interference coming from primary user to the second user. So if R1 is too small, then the primary user will cause interference to the second user operating in the LAZ region and there is no uh, significant benefit of you know doing spectrum sharing if there is too much interference. And so, so th those, those are the factors which determine the lower bound on R1. And we also uh, have a provision to 
uh, to incorporate sensing results from the surrounding environment to uh, create a lower bound on R1. So that, that is where we combine the benefits of spectrum sensing, uh, driven spectrum sharing to, uh, with, with the database driven spectrum sharing. And similarly, the number of secondary users that operate in the LAZ region, it also has upper bounds, because if we allow too many secondary users to operate in the region, then there will be uh, issues with coexistence between the secondary users, and there will be, uh, there will be uh, issues such as if, if the number of spectrum requests is you know, smaller than the number of secondary users that we, that we actually allow in that region, that doesn't make sense. So that also creates an upper bound uh, on the number of second users that we allow in the LAZ region. So this results in a mixed integer nonlinear programming problem, and we use genetic algorithm to solve it. So now let's uh, get to the simulation results section. So here we show how our framework adapts to uh, different network conditions and different uh, parameters, different factors that we encounter in the spectrum sharing. So for example, interference threshold of the primary user. So as the interference threshold of the primary user increases, as it can tolerate more and more interference, the radius inner boundary, the inner boundary radius can be decreased. It can be brought closer to the primary user to allow, to make the, to expand the LAZ region so that more number of secondary users can be allowed in that region. And here in the third plot on the very right, uh, ASC represents the area sum capacity, which is basically the summation of link capacities of uh, individual secondary users, where a secondary user has been defined um, as a single transmitter and single receiver system. So the transmitter is at the center of the cell radius and then uh, center of the circle and the receiver, there's one receiver at the edge of the edge of the uh, secondary user cell. So as you can see, when M increases, the area sum capacity also increases, but since we, since we cannot go beyond a certain value of R1, so that is the lower bound on R1, so when the lower bound on R1 kicks in, we cannot, in, we cannot decrease the value of R1, meaning we cannot increase the size of the LAZ region. That's why we cannot increase the number of secondary users in that region, and which results in uh, saturated uh, gain in ASC curve, as well as the saturation that we see in the first figure. So now how, now here, here we, show, we show how our framework adapts to the number of secondary user requests. So if, so when secondary user request per unit area is very small, so let's refer to the figure in the middle. So our framework makes the LAZ region larger by decreasing the size of R1, and then allow almost all of the requests you know, to, uh, to be granted with spectrum access grants. So in other words, all the, most of the requests will be responded by the database with spectrum access grants, and they will be allowed to operate in that region. But when the number of secondary user requests per unit area is very large, then we want to move the uh, inner boundary radius towards the outer boundary radius so that large number of secondary users operating in the LAZ region do not cause interference to the primary user. So, that, so all these three figures, the interpretation is same as the previous figures. Uh, it just shows how our framework adapts to the uh, number of secondary user requests. So similarly, uh, we, we show how MIPS framework adapts to different cell sizes, and we, we can see a similar you know, trend here when the secondary user cell size changes, the inner, inner boundary also changes, resulting in change in N and ASC. And this, this plot basically shows the power of small cell technology because we can see, see that when the cell size is small and can be made very large, this results in a large gain in area sum capacity. And finally, 
uh, how does our framework adapt to different secondary user transfer power levels? So here we assume that, so we assume that secondary user, you know, might change its transfer power, you know, throughout the time. And then the MIPS framework has to adapt to that as well. And we can see uh, from, from the, actually from the very last figure that the secondary user transfer power can be actually optimized for maximizing the area sum capacity. There is like, it is maximum only if the secondary user transfer power takes a certain value and then it again starts to decrease. So we can see, the, we can optimize it basically. But that is of course out of scope of this work. And finally, uh, this is the curve that shows the, uh, that shows how our approximation you know, matches with the results from Monte Carlo simulations. Basically, uh, does our approximation hold, you know, and and still, you know, make sure that the primary user does not get interference from the primary user? And yes, the curve, you know, our results suggest, you know, that the primary users uh, will not be interfered significantly by the secondary users. Uh, by, by making the approximation that we, that we did uh, for coming up with this framework. And by the way, here, here we, we compare it for different scenarios where the ratio of uh, gamma over sigma is different. And in all, almost all the cases, the interference tolerance, the interference protection criteria is uh, satisfied in almost all the cases. Here, here the interference threshold have, was set to minus 100 dBm, and epsilon was set to 0 0.1. Before I move on to conclusion, I would also like to illustrate uh, through an example the economic merit of using this framework. So uh, this figure you know, demonstrates how, how our framework can be used to improve the economic value of the spectrum. So in the center of the circle, what you see is a AWS-3 band-based uh, satellite earth station. So it has, according to the FCC, sorry, according to, I think, NTIA defined the exclusion zone boundaries for satellite earth station. So according to any NTIA calculations, the exclusion zone boundary is around 126 kilometer in radius, which is the outer boundary. And if, if we implement our framework in this scenario, you know, for a particular set of values of ITH and epsilon and other, fact, other parameters, we can see that we can allow some secondary users to operate in the green annular region, which encompasses three major US cities, including Washington, Baltimore, and Richmond. And these three cities combinedly have a population of approximately 10 million people. So assuming that the uh, bandwidth used by this particular station is 15 megahertz, our uh, scheme, you know, adopting our scheme for this particular uh, primary users, primary user will increase the spectrum value by uh, around 150 million megahertz population, which is in dollars around 132 US dollar, 132 million US dollars. So finally, conclusion. So reduce, reducing the size of exclusion zones plays a vital role in realizing effective spectrum sharing, both technologically as well as economically. So in this work, we proposed a framework which we named MIPS, and it adjusts the size of the exclusion zone boundary by dynamically adapting to changing interference conditions and the network the wireless network. And our results demonstrate the effectiveness of our scheme in improving the overall <coughs> spectrum utilization, both uh, in terms of the area sum capacity gain and in terms of the economic gain. And as our future work, we plan to study how the available spectrum resources can be actually allocated to the querying secondary users, because there will be always less <coughs> number of spectrum uh, access grants that we can provide in the LSE region than the actual demand. So how do we fairly allocate those spectrum access grants to those uh, querying secondary users? So that brings to the end of this talk. Thank you very much for coming.
So, does anyone have any questions? Can you go back two slides? Just on the contour. Uh, I was wondering, or, yeah, what uh, path loss co coefficient and shattering are going to be used for that? Oh, this is basically, this was not done, you know, by actually computing the inner radius. What we try to show here is if we can, you know, reduce the size of the exclusion zone, then it has some economic, you know, merits that we can obtain from that. And our, our framework provides a model, analytical model to actually study how much, you know, uh, interference, how much interference protection to the primary users can be, you know, traded for improving maybe the, uh, you know, economic value of the spectrum in this region. So you just made the circle smaller as an example? Yeah, th this is just an example. This, okay, this is just an example. And also, so to actually use these techniques, you need to know the path loss coefficient and the number of SUs, the density, and all that stuff. Yeah, you usually in database-driven spectrum sharing. Yeah, you do know that. Yeah, so the... Well, what we can do is, I think I should have mentioned that in one of the slides. So in database-driven spectrum sharing, let's say, you know, I want, to I want to transmit at my location maybe one hour from now. I want to start transmitting, you know, one hour from now, and I transmit for the four hours from, from that time. And I need to query the database at least, you know, a certain time before I actually you know, start to transmit. So the database will collect all the queries coming for that particular time slot, and then it will... Uh, you know, solve the optimization problem by considering all those factors. Well, so it is not actually in real time, but near real time implementation. You're saying the database has access to pretty much all this information? Yes. Like the number of SCUs, locations, and path loss and everything? Yeah. So if that's the case, can you just evaluate it without worrying about how to model everything? Yeah, but, but again, even if we know the actual Second, okay, we will know the actual secondary users only when they start transmitting, if we don't have... But they're letting you know when they plan to. Okay, even if they transmit, you know, since the wireless channel is, you know, a random channel, the interference caused by each and every secondary user to the primary user, it is not a, not a you know, definite quantity. Yeah, it is. you can find the average, and if you combine a ton of users, hundreds of users, Again, you know, do, doing that in maybe real time may be computationally very complex because you have to, if, even if you know the location of the secondary user and use a very, you know, precisely accurate propagation model, then there comes the cost of, you know, computational well, complexity, for example. Uses a, uses a channel model as well. So where do you get yours from? Yeah, so we... You just assume a path yeah, path it, is, it is an empirical path loss model where we get those, you know, values of sigma and uh, lambda, the propagation path loss exponent, and the variance of standard, you know, the standard deviation of fading through, you know, experiments. So for each reason, we know. Uh, so for uh, each, like, city or? Yeah, something like that. Region. So if there is a folly as in the loss coefficient. Yeah. Sorry, please tell me. So it's still kind of an open question of how to get the accurate channel model. Yeah, yeah, basically. If, if you want to do it in real time, it is, you know, like which channel model to use. And here, we started with a very simplistic model because, you know, we it is not a solution to actually, you know, this is how we should define the pro, uh, exclusion zone. This is a framework that lets us, you know, to play with the trade-off between uh, incumbent protection criteria and the secondary user spectrum utilization efficiency. Until now, there is no any you know specific framework that allows us to uh, play between you know those uh, trade-off. And we we can definitely consider more sophisticated propagation models, but then it will be difficult to maybe you know do it uh, accurately in real time yeah. because of computational complexity. And, and usually, you know, when we consider aggregate interference, maybe the small scale effects gets a result. That might be, you know, true in several scenarios. So 
Oh, it is basically we, we are doing everything in GB, so it is normal in GB scale and not log normal. Okay. Uh, do you think it's possible to divide the area into sectors and to multiple ranges? Of yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. Small part of the yes, map yes, over. yes. If if we know the uh, you know propagation characteristics are different in, in different. Annular sectors, that's what we are talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, if we know the propagation environment or parameters, you know, are different, or for example, if different types of secondary users operate in different annular sectors, just as in the example of 3.5 years band, so there will be, you know, sectorized tiers of secondary users. And yeah, we, we our, our model can definitely take Same model. Yeah, same model. Yeah, the, we apply this framework for each and every primary user separately. Okay. So if I understand your question properly, so what if the exclusion zones overlap in the LAZ region? Mm -hmm. Okay, usually they don't because if they are operating in the same channel, then you know their exclusion zones should be mutually you know exclusive. Otherwise, they will themselves cause interference to each other, right? So primary users exclusion zones are always like they they are you know separate. They do not overlap. Did, did I answer your question properly? Um, yeah. But if it is the case with you know adjacent channel, you know exclusion zone overlap, then maybe we need to consider the secondary users within those reasons for you know both primary users. And since we are our model is based on uh, geolocation database driven spectrum sharing, we know the you know location of the secondary users. So when we select the secondary users, we may want to select them, you know, uh, smartly such that they, you know, we can uh, have secondary users that do not cause interference to both the primary users simultaneously. If that will... If your primary user is very high, then you, know, you, you end up with a very conservative state that you know, you're actually bringing to normal secondary users. In the case of overlap? Yeah. These overlap might be very dangerous. Yeah. end up yeah, if the exclusion zones themselves are overlapping, then maybe, yeah, that, that's true. But I think that's not usually the case. So are we talking about commercial primary users, like users? Yeah, here, this was based on, you know, the satellite earth stations, but I think we can apply this framework to cellular systems as well. But maybe then we need to consider several other factors which we didn't in this. Time for one last question. I don't need a mic in front. Um, so, uh, going back to your, your uh, optimization problem. So, uh, just my, my question is about your cost function. Um, if you have a scenario where it perhaps is more important to have a bigger R1 in order to have a number of users, do you rewrite your costs associated with, with those? So you are saying for a particular sector, let's say we want to have. Say it's more important. To have yes. So so that's why that uh, eta is that eta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That eta is the weight of number of secondary users in each LAZ sector. And then do you weight your radius also? Or no? no, I think I think the radius will be weighted itself based on that because the radius is related to the number of uh, secondary users, right? Okay. Okay. Then. It it. It is, they are correlated, basically. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, so that's it.
Um, okay, let's thank uh, Sadiq one more time.